Hello and welcome to All Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Mowry of Drea Renee Knits and this is a little weekly podcast where I do my best to answer some of your questions that is always very knitting heavy because I'm a knitter. But we also jump around sometimes. We might talk about a little spinning because I love to spin. Or sometimes we talk about food, baking, sewing, who knows? Who knows what's gonna pop up? But we do know it'll always be at least some knitting. And this week I am wearing my broom pullover. This is my newest pattern. I just released it Tuesday. It is knit up in the Farmer's Daughter Fibers Odang DK. It's called Odang because you pick up a skein and you go, oh dang, it's that good. And this is a heavier weight one. So their original Odang is a lace weight. The thing I love about Surrey Alpaca yarns, besides the fact that they are so soft, they do this beautiful halo. The DK is even more textured, um, but I also love that they bloom. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this sweater because it's different. It's different than, I I'm just gonna tell you. Why preface it? Let's just jump right in. First, I'm gonna take a little sip of tea. In my ongoing caffeine arc, that is my journey. <laughs> I think I was drinking tea last week too, maybe. I was, I'm still on that kick. I, I'm still doing the matcha sometimes, but right now I'm really enjoying this little English breakfast with just a touch of Earl Grey. It's kind of my jam right now. All right, let's talk about the sweater. So this is a, classic wardrobe staple basically last fall my sister got this teal just kind of cozy looking sweater she just bought it at a shop we were in northern michigan and i was like well i wish i had a just a cozy pullover and so i started thinking about okay one of the things i loved about it is you could easily dress it up to go out we had all this family stuff going on and but then it could i also was like but i want it soft and snuggly enough for like tea and knitting time on the sofa. So <clears throat> right around that time, Candace was launching this new yarn. And I knew, I was like, oh, this is gonna be perfect. So I started kind of with my wish list of what do I wanna see in my sweater? So one of the things is I love a tall neck, especially living in cooler climates, that wind comes in and I just like to feel cocooned and cozy. So I love a tall neck. This has a tall neck, but if you look, do you see how this doesn't have, it's not a turtleneck. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a turtleneck. I just can't handle something super tight on my neck. I used to be able to, but now in just even the past year, it got a lot worse where I get gaggy. I can't, I don't like anything that feels like it's like stiff right here or tight. Um, so anyways, I did a, it's not a mock turtleneck. I also wouldn't call it a turtleneck. I'm going to call it a tall folded collar. So I knit it just like I would any doubled collar, any folded collar that you might see that are usually like an inch. Um, I just did this one for longer. And so it is all connected. So there's no fold. The other thing I don't love about just folding it is it shifts. And you know how you have like the bottom inch of your turtleneck ribbing, it's like down here, but then the fold like throughout the day wiggles and it's like up here. And it kind of drives me bonkers. So I like that this one's just in place. It's right where I need it all the time. So I also decided I wanted more positive ease. Again, I think it still looks really, really polished even with the positive ease, but I wanted it to be comfy, cozy and wear it with different outfits. Having that little bit of positive ease, I feel like I could do like a French tuck into some nice trousers. Um, one of, we did a photo shoot with a few different outfits and one of them I wore some wool trousers I have. I actually never did do the French tuck, but I think it would have been cute now that I'm thinking about it. Um, but it's also like right now I'm wearing leggings and it's just so comfy with leggings. So I just wanted one of those wardrobe staples that I could knit again and again and again. And I did, I knit it twice. So this is the original, this is the first one. Again, with that Odang DK. So here's the thing. 
I knew that this is a pretty unique yarn. It's very fluffy. It is mostly alpaca, that brushed surrey alpaca, it's like 90%. And then it has 10% silk, which is really just the core that holds it together. Um, so the thing with this yarn and that I find with most fluffy yarns, like your mohairs, your, your surrey alpacas, etc., your brushed cashmere, um, is that they bloom. So you can do what I call push engage, where usually a DK yarn, I'm going to knit that up on maybe size five or six needle, depending on what I'm knitting. Um, maybe a seven if I'm feeling like it, but probably not. Six is probably my happy place with DK. And my gauge is probably going to be somewhere between 22 and 24 stitches per inch or two and a half centimeters around there. I mean, that's all. I'm just throwing out an example, um, an average, if you will. This sweater is 17 stitches per four inches. So that is 4.25 stitches per inch compared to like six stitches per inch. So the gauge is quite a bit bigger. So knowing this is a unique yarn, I was like, okay, there are just going to be some people who can't get this yarn for whatever reason. And so how are they going to use a different yarn? So at first I was like, <coughs> I um, collaborated with my friend Candace from the Farmer's Door Fiber. So I was like, okay, I'm going to look at her DK yarns. I'm going to try one of those out. So I tried just straight DK wool yarn. I had to go up so many needle sizes to match gauge that the fabric was too open and loose. It just was not the same fabric structure as what I have in the original. So I wasn't happy with how that would have turned out. And the proportions of the stitch to row gauge were totally different. So even once I got stitch gauge, the row gauge was so off that it, I would have to write a different pattern because the gauge was too different. So I was like, okay, that isn't working. So then I thought, okay, well, the reason that, I hope you all have your, your drink, because apparently last week I did a TED Talk on billing. <laughs> this week, it's all about the broom sweater and yarn substitutions. So these are some of the things we have to think about. So I hope this is helpful in general when thinking about yarn substitutions. Like, oh, here's some of the things we might have to think about that might come up, especially if we're using a unique yarn. So I was like, okay, one of the reasons this can be knit up at this large gauge without creating this, like you can't see my hand through there. It's not like this is, a, there's definitely drape because of the fabric, but it's not see-through, it's not open. Um, so I was like, okay, one of the reasons I can get this larger gauge is because this yarn blooms and it fills in all those spots and it makes this really nice fabric. So I think I need to keep the fluff. I need the fluff. So I was like, okay, well, usually a much easier fluff to find is a lace weight fluff. So again, your mohair, your regular old surrey alpaca, um, brushed cashmere, etc. a lot of those are lace weight. So it's like, okay, those are gonna be more readily available from different spots. And Candace happens to have one I love that I had in my stash, which is the original O'Day. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna grab O'Dang and I'm gonna hold that double with something else. So I played around with swatching and settled on, I had some Spinster's Daughter, which is a collab yarn between Farmer Starter Fiber and Spin Cycle, where Spin Cycle spins it, they mill it, and Farmer Starter Fibers dyes it. So I happened to have both of those yarns, same color, I was like, okay, I'm gonna swatch it. And it was, perfect exact spot on gauge so I knit that up and here it is and here is my other one so actually I'm gonna try it on for you so you can see because they are different so the sub worked great so if you want a sub for any reason I recommend finding a sport weight I went wool I can't really speak to like I think a blend would work okay, but can't really speak to if you go cotton or linen or something like that because it's just gonna grow so differently. So definitely swatch. Um, but I would basically go sport weight yarn plus a lace weight fuzzy yarn if you want a sub. And I think that worked out really, really well, but it does create a different fabric. So again, you can see just that nice like drape. It's like those fabric videos if you, <laughs> If you go to any fabric sites, a lot of times they'll have like a little like stop, mo not stop motion, but like a quick little loop video of like the fabric being waved so you can see the drape. Okay, so this is the original. 
I really should have probably prepped my undergarment for this situation, but it's just a little tank top, so it's fine. Okay, make sure I am putting it on the right way. I have my friend Shelly from Shelly Can has these great labels that you can put in your sweater that says this is the back and I have a bunch. I just need to sew them in. Okay, so here is version two. So still great, great drape, right, right. Really lovely drape. It is heavier. So if you were lifting the sweaters up like one in each hand, this one weighs more. And that's because of that wool sport weight yarn in there. It's a denser yarn. And so it weighs more. So this one, um, and that's not a negative. I love the lightweight factor of the DK one. Um, it reminds me of ready to wear. And sometimes there is something that's nice about a ready to wear sweater is that they aren't always as dense as something we might hand knit. So I do love when I'm able to achieve something that's kind of as lightweight, especially when I think about like packing and things like that. Um, it can be really nice. This is not a heavy sweater by any means. It's just heavier than the DK. Um, one thing I do love about this version is the stitch definition is a lot stronger. Yeah, see that stitch definition? Whereas in the Odang, you aren't gonna see a ton of stitch definition because it's such a textured yarn. So it's very dark and rainy today um, because it's such a fluffy textured yarn. So they just have kind of a different look. Uh, the other thing, and I thought this was a great, great question that I got from somebody from my newsletter is they noticed that the necks aren't all the same like when they looked at my test knitters and again that depends on your yarn so you can see this still is not tight it's not doing the neck hug there's still this nice openness around the neck but it doesn't have quite the same stability I found for me um it's a little just like softer I mean it is it's standing up pretty nice though so Again, this is the holding two strands. This one feels even a little dressier to me, but maybe it's just because it's silvery white and I don't generally wear a lot of this color because I'm going to be honest, I tend to stain things. Like when I'm in the kitchen, I do not let me cook anything with a tomato sauce in it because it will get on me. Like I have to be very careful with what I wear in the kitchen. So this is me tempting fate. So this is something that like I would wear when I want to be a little more dressed up and I'm not going to go in the kitchen and do anything with tomato sauce. Um, so anyways, there are the two versions. So again, you can kind of see them both in action. All right. And I will just keep this one on. I won't make you watch me change again. Um, I'm not, I'm not one of those clever outfit people on Instagram who have like their whole way that they like put on their outfit. <laughs> okay. So, wow, that was a lot. We are halfway, halfway into this episode all about the sweater, but I hope you found it interesting. I hope you find it interesting to kind of think about yarn substitutions and things to think about. So there we go. You can find this pattern in my Ravelry shop and my web shop. And if you're a newsletter subscriber, make sure you've checked your inbox because there is a discount through tonight, Friday night, uh, for both me and the Farmer's Daughter Fibers. So if you have not checked your mail since Tuesday, make sure you go check it. All right, let's get into some questions. Question number one, socks with texture on the bottom. I've made pairs of your bare paw socks for my whole family. One struggle I'm having is that right on the bottom of the heel, the ribbing wears extra thin. I've been darning my little heart out fixing them, but I'm trying to make a pair of DRK everyday socks and just haven't been having luck with the ribbing under the foot. Do you have that problem? What would you do to fix it? Could I just leave the bottom of the foot as stockinette or would that change the circumference too much? So I have not had that problem. I definitely have a specific part of my socks that I wear out. So it might not be the ribbing. It might just be that that is your major friction point. And that's just where your socks wear out first. Um, so definitely pay attention to a couple things. 
you know what, let's, let's tackle the ribbing first though. If you wanna try not having the ribbing, you can absolutely just trade it for stack and net. It should not adjust the um, circumference of your sock. So I would just take half the stitches, like the stitches on the bottom needle, and you can just trade those right into stockinette. The only thing you're gonna need to think about is the heel. As we make the heel gusset on that sock, we do that in ribbing. So you'll need to decide, do I wanna add those stitches in ribbing to stay uniform with the top, or do I want it in stockinette to go with the bottom? Um, it is going into the heel, the back of the heel, and then you're gonna go into the back of the sock. So you'll just have to decide what you wanna do with that. That's the only thing I would pre-think. Um, but don't change the stitch count or anything, just do it in stockinette instead of in ribbing. And okay, but other things you can try. If you like the ribbing, if you like that full, the reason I like a full ribbed sock is because I like that it really fully hugs my foot. So here's a couple things to think about. Number one, make sure you're picking the correct size. If your socks are too loose, then there is more friction happening when you wear them in shoes and they're gonna wear out quicker. So I like to have some negative ease in my socks so that they are stretched nice and um, tight around my foot. Number two is the yarn you're using. So depending on what yarn you're using, is that yarn, do you need a touch of nylon? Um, does it have a good ply on it? Uh, da -da -da. Is it growing a lot after you knit your socks? So sometimes too, we've picked the proper size, but maybe we get a lot of post blocking growth and now all of a sudden the sock's a little too big. So again, kind of checking that out. Um, but that could be a couple things too. Let's say you've got a yarn that you've kind of been using for all these socks and they're wearing out. Maybe you need to switch up the yarn. Um, okay. I think that's, I think that was it. Did I have another idea? I don't think so. Um, and I have heard, I haven't played with it much, but I do think that there are, <coughs> excuse me, um, some different stitches you can do that are supposed to be stronger. Like I think maybe even like seed stitch, but that doesn't seem super comfortable. I don't know. Anyways, play around with it. Try out stockinette, try switching your yarn, check your size um, and good luck. Okay, next question. I love to wear shawls, cowls, basically anything around my neck. I also love to wear makeup and like to blend my foundation down my neck. I was hoping for some tips and tricks on washing makeup out of our delicate nets. Thank you so much for taking time to answer all these questions. So I, right now, am wearing a very light colored sweater and I've actually had this issue this past year. I found this tinted sunscreen that I love. It's all I wear on my face. Um, and it's great. I know that I've got my super good sunscreen for going outside and it's just enough coverage that I like how it looks, but it rubs off like there's no tomorrow. Like there is no setting in that sunscreen. It gets on everything. So I would love if other people could weigh in on this, if they have had any tips, cause I'm kind of in the same boat, like, oh, I really don't want to stop using this tinted sunscreen, but it gets on everything. So one thing I have tried is using a setting powder. I don't know if you do that. I do think that has helped a little bit. So like um, when I'm wearing this sweater, I'll put on a little setting powder and I feel like then that sunscreen doesn't wear off so much. So that might help, I would assume, with foundation as well. Um, the other thing is I have tried when I've gotten like a little stain on something, I will just do really gentle agitation to try and get that out. But if anybody else has any good tips on that, I think just in general for getting stains out of our knits, um, I wear the things I make. Like I'm not a gentle with my clothing person. <laughs> as far as everyday life goes, I cook in my clothes, play with my kids in my clothes. We do, you know, like I, I don't generally have like, oh, these are my fancy clothes and these are my everyday get dirty clothes. Like they kind of all have to be all purpose. Um, so I would love tips. If anybody else has any good tips for that, please share them. Because uh, I would like to know too. We don't want to felt our nets by over agitating, but I do think a little bit um, 
I've, I have attempted a little spot treating too, and I do find just like a little gentle agitation seems to be okay. But if anyone has anything else, I would love to know. All right. Could I knit the tessellated pullover or cardigan with just the MC and then a fluffy yarn for both CCs? So really making it two color versus three. Will this dramatically affect the row gauge? I knit the pullover already in three colors and think it would be fun to try a two color version. What are your thoughts? Okay, I'm gonna just very gently wipe my nose. I'm so sorry. I am still getting over a bug that has been with me for too long. Um, 100% you can do two color. Uh, definitely check your gauge, do a gauge swatch. Uh, as far as switching to just the fluff for the whole thing, I I think it's gonna be fine, but I would hate to tell you that and then have your row gauge be off. So do a good swatch and just check that. I think if you were just doing the MC, and then the other sport weight yarn, I think it would be fine. But set again, the yarns that I used were both those fluffy yarns that bloom. So I think they'll be fine, but just swatch to make sure. But otherwise you can absolutely do that stitch pattern with two colors. And then you don't have to manage all three balls, which is nice. <laughs> All right, question number four. So this is a two-parter, so I thought I would just answer it all in one go because it's all in one topic. So, um, okay. <clears throat> I am curious how in the world people do magic of drafting fiber while their supported spindles are spinning. Is this something that just happens after a while? Is it dependent on the type of supported spindle? <clears throat> Mine just stops spinning as soon as I try. Um, okay, and there's also a side question. What do you use to curl your bangs? Uh, thank you. I actually just blow dry them by pushing them one way and then the other. But if once they get long and get in my eyes, I'll use a flat iron to like give them a little wiggle so that they're out of my face. Um, but that's it for the bangs. <laughs> and okay, so I love that you asked this question. I think I've covered it once a long time ago, but I'm happy to cover it again because this stumped me when I started support spindle spinning. And I think it's something that people who have been spindle spinning for a long time can take for granted. Oh, good. I, I even have my spindling stuff right here. Um, because I was even spinning with my friend and she was doing it and she was like, well, try and do it continuously. And I'm like, it pulls the spindle up <laughs> or it stop like what? It makes no sense. So I, I'm going to see if I can get my camera angle to show you. Um, maybe on here. I'll bring a couple different bowls out. We'll see what's going to work best for where I am right now. Okay. I didn't really plan. <laughs> My desk is actually full of spindles right now and, and it's a mess, but we're going to go for it. This is real life, people. There's no manicured sets here. <laughs> All right, so I have to see if I can tilt. Oh, wait, I can just bring it down. Hey, all. <laughs> look at that all right I think I might actually this might be a little too tall for me to do so I think I'm gonna have to do this one so here's my spindle so what you want to think of is at least as far as I know and again I am not a spinning instructor uh so take what you will <laughs> there's my my warning um Okay, let's see if that's, yeah, it's going to be in frame. It is, I actually wish this was a little bit lower now. Let's actually try. I wonder if I do this in my lap than with my hand. Oh yeah, this might be better. Sorry, I wish you could see back a little farther, but just pay attention to my hands. The fiber is actually not that important to see. Um, so here's the thing. It's supported long draw not just long draw. So long draw to wheel, you can literally just one-handed draft your fiber out. If you try to do that from a spindle, it will pull your spindle up or stop it from spinning. So what I do is I flick and then my hand's hovering above and you see how I'm 
pinch and open as I draft my fiber. And that gives me something to pull the fiber against as I'm drafting. Whoopsie. So let me, so do you see how this hand, my hand that I'm drafting with is pulling and this hand that's flicking is doing this pinch little, kind of like a little lobster claw like this, drafting it. And that gives me something to pull against while I draft it out. And then I check my twist. So you know you have enough twist if when you check it, it's not breaking apart. And then I wind a little temporary cop and I keep going. And I'll do this one more time up above just in case you do want to see a little more of the spindle in action, I'll do it. I wonder if I have a flatter dash. I do. It's a flatter dash that's not quite so high as that one. There we go. So I fl flick it and then draft it out. And then I wind it right here. This is called a temporary cop. I got a little overexcited there. There we go. And that is where I store this just so I can keep spinning for a while. And then once it gets too full, I will rewind it down below onto my actual cup. Pop. Like that. So, oh, look. Ooh. Look at this, Andrea. What if you went ahead and got closer? So, again, what I'm doing is after I flick, I am really wish it would focus can I let's see if I can force its focus stay there that's right lock in right there um so I am pinching on this fiber as I draft it out okay I'm gonna try and lock her again see if my phone will listen to me so I spin and then I open and close as I draft like that all right, I hope that helps. Um, there are probably profesh videos out there in the world. <laughs> probably better than that, but there you go. You got to do the pinching thing, and that's called supported long draw, and it will change your life as you support spindle spin. Because once I figured that out, I was like, oh, <laughs> this is so much easier. Um, so I hope you find that helpful. All right. But we are not done talking support spindles yet because we had one more question. So, Andrea, <clears throat> can we talk about support spindles? I'm seeing them everywhere, but I'm not seeing support spindles for sale many places. I'm fairly well immersed in the fiber arts community and I'm not finding them at local wool events or yarn shops. The few I have seen online seem a fair bit more pricey than drop spindles and maybe I need to get a bowl too. Can you tell us about the equipment and where we can get them at a range of price points? So, I think the world needs more spindle makers. I have noticed that too. It can be tough, especially when I was first getting started, as I was trying to discover spindles, where to get them. It was tricky. Um, so, Etsy is a great place to check out. I'm going to share some of my favorites. I have found them from everything from probably about $60 all the way up to like $110. Um, so the prices do vary. They are not super inexpensive, but compared to a wheel, they're definitely a lower price point to get you going. Um, I do know that there are some drop spindles out there in like the $20 range. I would imagine there are some supports. Again, look on Etsy. There are a range of price points. I haven't tried them all. So I kind of found my favorite. So that's what I'm going to share. And I would say they roughly are between $60 and like $95. Okay. So <clears throat> support spindle. Here is one of my first. This is a Dan Tracy. Um, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and type in what I show you so I can give you links in case they have websites. So Dan Tracy, I got this at Rhinebeck. So if you are able to go to some of the bigger 
fleece focus festivals, I think that is where you might have a little better luck getting a support spindle. Um, so Rhinebeck was promising. Um, Maryland Sheep and Wool would probably be a good one. Um, or if you have a more fiber focused shop. So we have a fiber shop here called Port Fiber and they usually do have spindles in stock. Um, and they usually have like a little like some like drop Turkish and some supported. Um, but okay, so this is my Dan Tracy. And ba -ba -ba -ba. I don't remember how much that was. I'm sorry. It was in the hullabaloo of Rhinebeck. So <laughs> this is an Enid Ashcroft. And I want to say this one was about 60. I don't remember exactly. Um, but she sells on Etsy every Saturday. And I believe it's listed on her Etsy shop and on her um Instagram says when the shop updates are so that's helpful okay this is Bjorn Peck this is one of my like spindle babies and it's a little bowl um this one's so my very good friend Mel had a Bjorn Peck and he is in Sweden and I emailed him <laughs> for many a moon to get one of these so he does not always have them stocked um but I believe he usually does a wait list and so that's what I did I got on a wait list and was able to get a spindle from him and I love it um and his all come with a bowl which is really nice so you did ask about bowls uh you will need something to spin in because support spindles are supported so they need something to spin on you can find something at your house if you have a little dish i started with a little ceramic dish but note of warning if you're going to use a ceramic dish make sure it's smooth mine was a little rough and i think that it um kind of i mean just barely but i noticed a change in the tips of some of my wood tipped spindles so just be careful with what you choose but otherwise glass works great um and some spindle makers include do sets of like a spindle and a bowl um i know Crevel i don't have any crevellis but crevelli a lot of times you can do a spindle plus a bowl um bjorn peck woodworking came with a bowl um i really love love that bowl um okay Spanish Peacock. So Spanish Peacock is one of the like coup de gras of the of the spinning world. Everybody wants a Spanish Peacock. These are not easy to get. <laughs> they do. One of the things I love though, they, their spindles are amazing. I mean, look at, there it is. Look at that. Oh my gosh. So beautiful. So beautiful. The one I was demoing on, that is also a Spanish peacock. It's actually my favorite one. The shaft is like this blue color, and then it has this white um, Tibetan cup on it. So this one is called, I think, a bulb. So their spindles are very, very beautiful, so well made, and some of my absolute favorite to spit on. Um, so they are very sought after, and you can only make so many spindles, right? It's one guy making them. But one thing I love that they do is they do what's called a stealth update. So they won't say they do all their, most of their updates. They will do a few scheduled around the year, but otherwise they do them at random days and times to try and give more of a fair chance of people to get them, you know, so that it can't just always be the same group getting in there and buying up all the spindles every time. It does mean it's tricky. You just can't go on there any time of day or week because you decide you want to spindle that day you got to keep an eye on it and hope you get one but i will say when you get one it's worth it they're really really lovely spindles um they do have spindle bowls that they sell separately sometimes they'll do a set um i have one of their lap bowls i like this you just squeeze it between your thighs um or i'll sit it next to me and spin in that little dish and i really like that okay i think i only have two more to show um 
And again, I'm only touching the surface, but these are the ones that I've kind of found. So Woodland Woodworking is another great one, especially if you love some of these really cute carved, um, adorable designs. Look at the inside of that mushroom. Do you see its little gills? I love, this is my favorite Woodland Woodworking because it has the turquoise inlay. Um, so they do all kinds, they do cute little sheep and birds. This is the mushroom one. They do a morel mushroom, uh, but they update weekly. So it's Woodland Handcrafts or Woodland Woodworking. You can find them under either name. And they do an update every Saturday afternoon. And what's great is you can sign up to be, they let one shopper, they do a random draw every week and they let one shopper go in early and shop spindle stress-free. You get to pick one spindle and purchase it if you want to, if your name is drawn. Um, so I think that's another really cool way that they're trying to deal with. There's more people who want spindles than there are spindles available. Um, so Woodland Woodworking is a great, great one to try out. And the last one I'm going to share is called a glass spin. So these are from Mingo Asho. I wish I had an empty one, but I'm literally, it's all full up. Um, so they have this glass blown, hand blown glass bead at the end. And then they have these beautiful shafts that vary um, in the wood colors and everything. And then they also do this little wood burn design at the base. These do come with a little bowl. So if you buy one of their spindles, it comes with a little dish that you can spin in. I was not sure how this would go because it was so different than the other ones I had tried and kind of heavy. I love these. These are so fun to spin on. So that's called a glass spin. Um, so there you go. There are the ones that I have been, that's not even all of them, but that is what we'll kind of touch on for now. There is, um, some other people out there. There's Alice Savage does goddess style that are so beautiful. I actually think I have one of those right here. I do. It's connected to the background. Let me pull that off. So this is an Alice Savage. So this is more of like a goddess or a fang style spindle. Um, there's Alan Berry who does hand carved designs that are really cool. So, okay, I, I now, now we're getting into a supported spindle TED talk. So I'm going to end this part here, um, Alan Berry, but there is a list. There's a list to get you started. Most of these people, they're not going to just have a shop stocked full of them. You got to keep an eye or find out when they do updates, but I will include their websites. Um, you can also find them on Instagram. And again, what I started doing um, when I was trying to find some was Etsy too. It's just a great place. Just type in support spindle and see what you find. There are definitely more spindle makers out there than what I'm listing here. Okay. This is a long episode, you guys. If you're still with me, thank you. Okay. Last question. I am spinning for the traveler sweater knit along. I bought all the fiber and now I have a storage problem. I am spinning on a wheel. I know you talked about storing your spun yarn on weaving bobbins. I bought some to do just that. Now that I have transferred the spun yarn to the weaving bobbins, I don't know how to proceed. How do you get the yarn plied from the weaving bobbins? Help! I'm stuck and don't know how to proceed. Yes, you can ply right from those bobbins. So I take my weaving bobbins. I have one right here. I take my little weaving bobbin. It fits right on my lazy Kate, just like all of my big wheel bobbins. I just pop them right on there and ply directly from them. That's why I like to use them. Um, you can also sometimes find storage bobbins. I used to have some, now I'm going to forget the brand, but they stopped selling them. And I was so sad because they were a great price, but they were like $5 for these bobbins that you could use. Um, I wish I could remember their name, but I don't think they're around anymore anyways. Um, but because bobbins for wheel can be surprisingly pricey, uh, but that's a great thing to look at. If you ever go to craft shows, estate sales, um, antique shopping, garage sales, all kinds of stuff, keep an eye out because sometimes people are getting rid of stuff and they'll have bobbins. And so that's like to collect some of those bobbins because if you're doing a sweater spin, a lot of times you need like 
seven bobbins and that's depending on how much each bobbin can hold like I I think for me if I'm gonna do I think I usually need about seven for a sweater spin of just my singles and then I still have to ply onto something so um yeah you can ply right from those weaving bobbins and if you need to you can always spin some of your singles make a skein, ply it, empty those bobbins and do that. It's just not as ideal. It's a little harder to stay consistent when you have to do that. But sometimes that's just what we have to do. I've done that. My last sweater spin, I literally went skein by skein and it was fine. You know, it's not as consistent as some of my other sweater spins, but it's fine. Okay. Well, I think that's it. That was a lot. If you stuck with me this whole time, thank you. Thanks for being here. And... I hope that you are maybe having a little bit nicer weather than we are right now. We do have some spring-like weather coming, um, which is good because we're about to go into spring break. <coughs> so thank you for being here. Thanks for your questions and spending some time with me. I hope to see you back here next week and happy making. <laughs>